Thank you to the worship team. Thank you, Dr. Moeller, for uh, your incredibly gracious and affirming words, uh, both of the IMB and of our relationship. Michelle and I are so thankful for both you and Mary and the blessing that you have been to us for many years. Uh, and I am so thankful to be here today. It is good to be back home after sitting for seven years in the classrooms of Southern Seminary, earning those degrees, uh, and after teaching for more than a dozen years in those classrooms in a part-time capacity even, uh, this campus is home. Uh, we are so thankful for the ways the Lord has uh, used the ministry of this faculty and staff in our lives over uh, those many years. So thankful today that at least from my perspective in a 30 year history uh, with Southern Seminary, I've never known a season uh, where the IMB and Southern Seminary were more closely aligned and had a healthier, stronger partnership and relationship uh, than uh, we do today. Uh, so I'm incredibly grateful for Paul Aiken, his leadership of uh, the Graham School, uh, for Keith McKinley, uh, Dr. Booker, just that entire team and all of the faculty and staff here. And listen, uh, having had so many years of connection to Southern Seminary, what I've just shared with you is no small thing. I first arrived on this campus in the fall of 1992 as a new Masters of Divinity student, I can assure you things were different then. Al Mohler was not the president. Professors on faculty in whom we have so much confidence and trust today uh, were of, uh, of a different breed, many of them in that day. Uh, they publicly agreed to teach in accordance with and not contrary to the Baptist faith and message, but many privately held contrary convictions and regularly talked in accordance with those contrary convictions. I remember in my very first semester, my theology professor opened class with a prayer to Mother Wisdom. My ethics professor regularly made arguments to subvert the Bible's teaching on sexuality and the sanctity of life. That's hard for you to imagine as a student today at Southern Seminary, I know, but that was the campus I arrived to 30 years ago. And so I thank God for the campus that I arrived to last evening. Brothers and sisters uh, of the student body and even the faculty and staff, I pray these many years later, you do not take for granted what God has done here, uh, nor the privilege that each of us has to be connected to this seminary in this day under the leadership that God has given us for this season. Why does any of that matter? Well, that leads me to another question this morning, a question that I want to pose to you, and I would challenge you to seriously consider. The question I want to pose to you is this, what is the world's greatest problem? What is the world's greatest problem? We look this morning to the Old Testament book of Numbers, chapter 21. Numbers 21, picking up in verse 4, reading down through verse 9. Here is a record that comes from the wilderness wanderings of the Israelites. And this is what God says of the Israelites. Number 21 beginning in verse, Numbers 21 beginning in verse 4. From Mount Hor, they set out by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many of the people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. 
pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. What, in your opinion, is the world's greatest problem? Since the first week of March, I've traveled twice to the borders of Ukraine. The scenes of war and war crimes unfolding before our very eyes on the internet are scenes really only witnessed in previous generations by soldiers and those who cross their paths. And yet now, on our phones and our tablets and our laptops, we see it unfolding live before our very eyes. And it is unspeakable. It's a problem impacting the entire world. Yet, the daily death toll of the war in Ukraine has not even begun to approach the daily death toll of children murdered in the womb in our own country. As I look around this room of mostly young faces, it occurs to me that 20% of your generation, the generation of millennials, of Gen Xers, and the rising generation, 20% of that generation is not with us. Their lives were ended in the womb. 40% when we calculate the impact of abortion on African Americans in the United States in those generations. How could we measure a travesty such as that? Is there any greater problem in our world today? If so, what would it be? What problems, global problems come to mind? Is it human trafficking? Is it gender dysphoria or our culture's psychotic fixation on sexual deviation? Is it, as the liberal politicians would assure us, climate change? What is the world's greatest problem? I contend that the world's greatest problem can be communicated in a single word. Lostness. Lostness. It's the world's greatest problem. To be separated from God because of sin. To bear the wages, the consequences of sin, which is not only death, but eternal separation from God and hell. is a problem not only universal to every human being, it is a problem which no other problem in our world even begins to rival. To use a seldom used biblical image, humanity, collectively and individually, has been snake bit. Now, I hope no one gets overly uncomfortable with the mention of snakes. It's because what I want to do this morning is to share with you not one, not two, but three snake bite stories. Two from the Bible. In fact, you've already heard them referenced in the text that I read and Dr. Moeller read this morning. The one that's not from Scripture, but all the same is true. Before I comment on this passage further from Numbers 21, let me share with you that snake bite story that's not in the Bible, but is, I assure you, true because I was a firsthand witness. The snake bit me. During a summer break in my middle school years, I attended a wildlife conservation camp in West Tennessee where we spent an entire week learning about conservation and critters. From a beaver dissection to a meal of rattlesnake, conservation camp promised memorable experiences uh, that a young teenage boy was excited uh, to participate in. Let me assure you, 
conservation camp delivered on the promises. But none of the experiences compared to the two events that made the Tennessee conservation camp legendary. The Snake Roundup and the Snake Bite Club. For the Snake Roundup, we spent half a night wading through a West Tennessee swamp with flashlights catching water snakes. Then the following day, all of the non-venomous snakes that we had caught uh, were paraded through the camp in pillowcases. And that's when every camper had the opportunity uh, to join the Snake Bite Club. Can you imagine the advertisement for such an endeavor? It was a very simple process, uh, really. Typically, all you had to do was stick your hand in the pillowcase and you were a bona fide member of the Snake Bite Club. If, unfortunately, the snakes weren't as active in that pillowcase, as was the case in the one I stuck my hand into, not to worry. Very simple process would unfold from there. Just pull a snake out of the pillowcase. If that hasn't done the trick, just give the snake a little slap. <laughs> At which point, the snake would predictably return a slap of his own. Two fangs that hit me on the back of my right hand, and suddenly I was a lifelong member of the Snake Bite Club. Now, that's not my only Snake Bite story, but it's the best one. Unfortunately for the Israelites, as we find record here in Numbers 21, non poisonous water snakes that the camp counselors were carrying around in pillowcases in Milan, Tennessee, were not the kind of snakes they were encountering. The snakes in Numbers 21, as we clearly read, were deadly vipers. Nevertheless, like those of us who joined the Snake Bite Club in the summer of 83, the Israelites volunteered to be club members. Oh, it wasn't that they wanted to join the Snake Bite Club exactly, but they had willingly, readily conducted themselves in such a way that they invited the judgment of God upon their lives. And they did so knowingly. For you see, this wasn't the first time. They'd been wandering in the wilderness at this point for nearly four decades. They've been subjected to that journey, waiting on an entire generation to die because their conduct had repeatedly brought them under God's judgment. Time and time again, since their departure from Egypt, they had rebelled against God, they had broken his expressly stated laws, and time and time again, they had suffered his judgment. They had endured the painful consequences of their sin even death, consistently, as you read through the story of the Israelites' journey, consistently you see their sin had consequences. Of that, there could be no doubt, but that's always true of sin, is it not? This time, God's judgment upon the Israelites was in the form of venomous snakes, but consistent with his character, just as God judged Israel for their sin, God, as he had done in the past, once again offered grace and forgiveness in the form of a cure. The people came to Moses, verse 7, said, we've sinned, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And so Moses prayed to the Lord and the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent, set it on a pole. Everyone who is bitten when he sees it shall live. The cure to sin then and now is repentance. People experience the grace and mercy of God in response to their repentance. As God saw their repentance. He provided a pathway for forgiveness and for healing. Look upon the bronze serpent set upon a pole and you will live. But there's more to the snake bite story. In fact, there's a lot more. This 
snake bite story is a foreshadowing of another snake bite story to come. Even more than a foreshadowing, it's prophetic. For more on that snake bite story, uh, we turn back to Genesis 3. Picking up in verse 13. Then the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. And now hear the Proto-Evangelion. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. The problem the Israelites were facing was not a new problem. It was Eve's problem. It was Adam's problem. It would soon be Cain's problem. And later the problem of the earth in Noah's day. It was the problem of the earth in the days of Jeremiah the prophet. It was the problem of the earth in the days of Isaiah and Ezekiel. In fact, it has been the problem of humanity every day since the fall our greatest problem. And in fact, it's a greater problem today than it's ever been. What is the world's greatest problem? Lostness. Our separation from God because of our sin. Our research department at the International Mission Board reports to me a number each March based upon global population, global death rate, and religious affiliation, they report to me the estimated number of people who die daily apart from Christ. That number for this year is estimated to be 157,690. Every day. 157,690 people die who have given no evidence that they have heard and believed the gospel, that they have repented, that they have found God's solution to their greatest problem, that they have been forgiven, born again, saved, and will spend eternity in heaven. No, they will spend eternity in hell. That number is not shrinking, it's growing. In fact, more people will die lost today than on any day upon which the sun has set in human history. And this, brothers and sisters, is why the IMB exists. It's why you have answered God's call to ministry. We know the solution to the world's greatest problem. And we have been called to share it with those who have yet to hear it. Thank God for the solution, which takes us back to this third snake bite story. A story that begins in Genesis 3 and culminates, at least to a point, in John 3. Dr. Moeller read the verses from John 3, the interaction of Jesus and Nicodemus. I want to highlight for you again verse 14 from John 3. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. As Moses lifted up the servant in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. God has solved the problem of lostness 
That solution, determined before the foundations of the world were set in place, begins at Golgotha, where the Son of Man was lifted up on the cross and where he died. For our sake, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, Paul declares in 2 Corinthians. Paul calls him in Romans 3 the atoning sacrifice. He's the once for all sacrifice according to Hebrews 10, the better sacrifice according to Hebrews 9, the one who was lifted up and those who look to him are forgiven. Those who repent, trusting in him are saved. But the story doesn't end with a bruised heel and deadly bite of a serpent to which a savior who so loved you Willingly, willingly was subjected. We're reminded this holy week that this snake bite story ends at a garden tomb where the one who died is raised, crushing the very head of the serpent and declaring victory over death, hell, and the grave. God's solution to the world's greatest problem, the problem of lostness, is the gospel. It's the true story of Jesus' death and resurrection, the good news that any who have faith in him and what he did, who repent, who confess him as Lord, are saved from the judgment of God. Any who would with faith look upon the Son of Man who has been lifted up as the bronze servant was lifted up in the wilderness will have eternal life. A pillowcase filled with serpents. Thankfully, no one accidentally included a cotton mouth. The story might not have had a happy ending, and I wouldn't be here today. An infestation of serpents in Israel's camp. The judgment of God upon the sin of a rebellious people. Judgment which led to repentance and restoration by the mercy and grace of God. A serpent slithering into Eden's garden, a fall, judgment, but then a cross, and thank God, an empty tomb, a gospel, God's solution. The IMB exists today, 177 years after it was formed, and those first two young single missionaries were appointed, who a year later boarded a ship for China, then married, and we saw four go to the nations. 177 years later, the IMB still exists because there are yet 7,000 of the nearly 12,000 people groups that have been numbered around the world that remain unreached with the solution to their greatest problem. Of those 7,000, there are 3,000 that remain unengaged. What does it mean to be unengaged with the gospel? There was no place on Palm Sunday if you lived among one of those people groups where you could have gone and heard the gospel preached in a local church because there's no church yet established. It would be very unlikely if the events of this Holy Week being celebrated here and in so many places of the world where the focus is upon Christ and him crucified in his empty tomb where you could hear anything about that. If you walk through your village, your community, your city, very unlikely that you would run into a missionary who was there to talk to you about your greatest problem, about God's solution, because the missionaries aren't there yet. Our work is not yet finished. Someday the vision of heaven will come to pass. Every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages will be represented before the throne. They aren't yet. And it's why we're still here. It's ultimately why Southern Seminary exists. It's why the IMB exists. 
It's why we issue the call even today to you. You know the solution to the world's greatest problem. We're sending missionaries to those who know nothing of that solution and who will die lost in their sin if someone does not go, if the gospel is not preached, believed, and they are saved. We're sending. Come go with us. The problem is real. You have the solution. Be used of God. Let's pray together. Father, thank you today for a story as old as time that highlights a truth that we cannot survive without. Thank you for being a God whose very character is love who manifests mercy and grace and who restores those who repent. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your willingness to be the agent of healing, eternal healing, for all who trust in what you have done. I pray, Lord, that you would use us, use these students, use our collective efforts, even as Southern Baptists, to see that Many, many come to know the truth of what you have done, even for them. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.